Hi, this is Pastor Rick, and welcome to the Buell Country Church. Today we'll be looking at Psalm 1. I've entitled it, Which Way Should I Go? Let's join in now as we begin to sing and worship together. Oh, this covenant is 
If you take your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Psalm today. It's real easy to find it because it's halfway through your Bibles, and we're on Psalm 1. Psalm 1. So if you take your Bibles and turn there. How many of you brought your Bibles? All right, good deal. Guess what? We're at church, and we use our Bibles here, so bring it on your phone, bring it on your tablet, bring it in a paper form, but make sure you bring it. My challenge to you is to always check up on what that preacher is preaching. Make sure it's there. Have you ever struggled making a decision? Yep, that's me. Anybody else want to join me in that? Maybe you wondered which was the right way to go. Some of our decisions in life, they're just harder than others. Should I buy a house? Should I not? Should I repair my old car or should I buy a new one? Should I continue in this relationship or should I end it? In 1963, Jimmy Soule gave us some advice on marriage that is more than just curious. He states in the opening lines of his song, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never make a pretty woman your wife. So from my personal point of view, get an ugly girl to marry you. Do you guys remember that song? 1963. Not all of the advice that we have available to us comes from sound and godly reasoning. He goes on to explain in the next verses his reasoning for his somewhat offensive statement. His advice is based on a sinful worldview apart from God. So his idea is like, if I take a physically unattractive woman as my wife, she'll be, feel privileged. I know, we're going to stone this guy, right? He'll feel privileged to be my wife and want to please me. Secondly, if I take a physically unattractive woman as my wife, others will not want her. So I won't have to worry about her cheating on me. A pretty woman would gain control over her husband and command attention. So not all the advice of the world is so blatantly obvious as going against God's standards. The book of Psalms opens with a tremendous challenge to all of us who would read it. It lays out before the reader two ways of living. It deals with both the chosen course of life and the results of it. Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would bring this scripture from Psalm 1 alive. And I pray, Lord, the message that you have for the church today, for us, would be real and powerful. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the way of the world. Because the way of the world is like de degrees of departure. So as I look at this, there's a battle for the mind. So number one, the way of the world is thinking like the world. Thinking like the world. And what happens is we get counsel from people around us, people that are not godly people, people that don't care about following the Lord. And a lot of times when something happens in our life, that counsel comes back as, you know, get even, get revenge, leave it, live for yourself, make sure that you're happy first, and so many other ways in which the world gives us counsel. Thinking like the world is our first step from de departing from God. Thinking like the world is our first step in departing from God. There's a battle for your mind. So the way that we think and the way that we make our choices and the very allegiance to God himself make a huge difference. So the way of the world is selfish and prideful and our natural selves want to be in control, exalting our own strengths. You know, in the United States, there's quite a few cool sayings that we take pride in. You know, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? You, you tough it out. You, you go. And yet, a lot of times we find that those 
types of sayings, I'm a self-made man, I'm a self-made woman, stem from pride that is inside. When reality is, a lot of times, to pull it up by your bootstraps, and the self-made man, and the self-made woman, and all those types of things don't really mean anything other than trying to convince yourself to keep going. What if instead we said, Lord, help me pull my boots up. Help me to keep on going. Lord, here's my life. I give it to you instead of being a self-made man or a self-made woman. I'm a God-made man and I'm a God-made woman. The way of the world is selfish and prideful. The acts of man come for what's inside of their heart. The Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, but your actions also come. What's inside of you, the things that you do, the things that come out, they don't just suddenly appear. It's because it's what's in your heart. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 17 or Jeremiah 31 that the heart is desperately wicked and beyond all cure. That's why when we're born again, we're given a new heart. We are bent to follow our own ways. So thinking like the world is the first step. Number two, acting like the world. That means our actions. The next departure from God's ways comes in our action. Every step that we take in the ways of the world is a step further away from God. I'm going to figure this all out myself. Well, how are you going to do this? I don't know. I'm just going to do it. Instead, we need to say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing here. I shared with somebody this week the definition of insanity. Maybe you've heard this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing, the same way, and getting the same bad result that we didn't want. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again. Well, it's when I was over pastoring at Evergreen Church in near Grand Rapids in Lowell, I had this brand new building that we moved into, and I was excited because I had a corner office and it sat right there, right by the evergreen trees in the woods and stuff. And, you know, during Sundays, you wouldn't see anything. But during the week, you could sit in that, uh, my office and this flock of turkeys would come up and around and they'd meander around there. And there was a couple of turkey hens that weren't very bright. And they would come up and see their reflection in the those nice glass doors and they'd come right up on the steps and they'd fluff all up and they'd go right at that turkey hen they saw. Well, it's a reflection. And that turkey hen would just keep going at it, going at it, going at it. The same result every time. Bonk, bonk. (laughs) I got pictures of these hens with their feathers all out, their wings all out, slamming against the door, trying to attack that other turkey, it was in their territory. And the whole time it was just a reflection. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, getting knocked down and doing it again and getting the same result. God wants us to follow him. But when we follow the ways of the world, we find things that just don't work out. Galatians chapter five, verses 19 through 21 says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Debauchery, by the way, is wild partying, not good partying. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul wrote this to the Galatian church, and he makes it very clear. So belonging, number three, the next step is belonging to the world or mocking God. 
And we've seen a lot of stuff right now out there on the media, Facebook, newspapers, not newspapers so much, but online articles and such about the whole Olympic uh, opening and how it really, and there's a great argument and people are going back and forth and such about, well, this great opening ceremony was a, uh, really a tip to Dionysius and no it was the Last Supper and no it was this, no it was that. When it comes down to it, the whole thing was ungodly. It doesn't matter what it was doing, though it looked very much like it was mocking the Last Supper drawing, but whatever it was, it was drag queens dressed up and it was paganism at its finest. Should we expect anything less from the Olympics, which is grounded, folks, in pagan celebration? We've changed it a lot, but they used to participate naked. This used to be a celebration of the gods. So do you understand that this, even though it's on a national, on, on a on a world level, do you understand that these competitions, there's so much revolving around them? We have to understand that. I'm not saying it's okay. In fact, I'm saying it's not okay. But can we avoid all the evil in this world? Pfft, no. No. When I was a kid stocking shelves at the drugstore, that same drugstore had pornography right there in the magazines, right there. It was available. And you go to most of your stores, up until now stuff is online. It was everywhere. You cannot avoid sin and evil. You just can't. Do you have to partake? No. Do you have to approve of it? No. But what would Jesus do? We're going to get into that in just a little bit here. But there comes a point when we mock God and our conversion or our stepping away from God seems to become complete. Sometimes we say it verbally, but many times we don't have to. We sit down in the seat of mockers and we don't even realize it. See, I'm seeing so many out there right now that are sitting down in the seat of mockers saying, I will sit with you and stand with you for your right to do this stuff. You're joining the mockery. Do you understand that? You're joining the mockery. Jesus never, ever joined the mockery. He would come up to people that were hurting and broken and he would set them free. Jesus never came and said, oh, I see your sin and you're okay. In fact, Jesus would go and he would meet with sinners and he would do different things. I love the story of the adulterous woman that got caught. They drag her out, the religious leaders drag her out. Don't know why they didn't drag the guy, but they drug her out in front of Jesus. And they said, look, we caught her. The law says you should stone her to death. You know, big rocks, throw rocks, kill her, not nice. So what does Jesus do? The Bible said that he kind of hung out there and he drew us in the sand. Doesn't say what he drew. But then he finally said to those religious leaders, you who is without sin, throw the first stone. And the Bible says that they dropped their rocks, dropped their stones and walked away and Jesus came up there. He didn't say, all right, that's all taken care of. No, he came up to him and said, where are your accusers? Well, they've all left. Well, then neither do I condemn you. What was the last thing he said to her? Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus is not about leaving us in our sin. He's not about letting us stay there He's about reaching a hand and pulling out. And it's not until we understand that living for God is way more important than joining with the world 
in all that's going on. Galatians 6, 7, Paul writes here, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And James 4, 4 says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend with God. Being short-sighted, thinking that this is all there is, will bring you to an end that you do not want. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you have ever been to a funeral before? All right. You've seen, sometimes they, they lay things in the casket, right, that are precious. Maybe it's a teddy bear or a medal that was won in war. Sometimes it's a, a token or whatever. But do you understand that they can't take that with them? They can't take that with them. It's kind of crazy, but we enter this world with nothing. And we leave this world with nothing. With nothing. If you dug those caskets up today, those mementos would still be there. Unless grave robbers got them. They would still be there. But when you look at that body, they are not there. I don't, you don't have to raise your hand on this one. Have you sat beside someone who's taken their last breath? It's a life-changing ordeal. When you've witnessed that, when you've witnessed life and then no life, it will change your life because you realize they're gone. There's no more conversations. I watched my mom pass from this life into the next. And I knew she'd never call me again and say, Rick, can you call me when you get a chance? I can hear her. You have loved ones that are the same way. When that life ends, it's done. There's no more chances in this life. Only in the life eternal do we have. So what about the way of God? The way of God does not come across or come naturally to any of us. We need to trust Christ as our Savior to walk with him every day in the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15. John writes in verses 4 and 5, Remain in me. He's talking about, this is actually Jesus speaking. He's writing down the words of Jesus. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to stay connected to Christ. We can't just willy-nilly it out there with no connection. It doesn't work that way. The popular slogan a few years ago, it got way overused, but it was WWJD. What does it mean? What would Jesus do? You know, and the, it got so bad, people were wearing that bracelet, they didn't even really know or understand. And, and I wanted to say a couple different people, I'm like, have you looked at your bracelet? You know, have you, do you understand what that means? Because what you're doing is not what Jesus would do. What would Jesus do? Well, here's the way to God. Number one, we need to think like Christ. We need to think like Christ. In order to think like Christ, we need to have our minds and our hearts renewed by him. We need to feed our minds with the word of God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Paul writes, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. One of my favorite animals in the, king, the uh, marine, land, marine kingdom is an octopus. Have you ever really studied or spent any time? You know, an octopus has a beak like a parrot, but the rest of it looks like snot. And, it, and it's got suction cups and tentacles and 
it doesn't matter as long as his beak can fit through a hole, that octopus can get through that. Octopus are incredibly smart. In fact, I used to keep all kinds of different uh, aquarium and, and uh, I was really considering to go into salt water and one of the things I wanted to do was have an octopus. But as I began to research them, those little boogers are smart and they're an escape artist. And it's very, very, very hard to keep them in a tank. They will escape. You would think, but they need to be in water. Well, they can be out for a little bit. But it's been known that in aquariums, they couldn't figure out why they were losing fish in other tanks. They just disappear to set up a camera. The octopus was escaping from his tank, crawling out across the floor, up and into another tank, eating the fish, going back to his own tank. Incredibly smart. Do you know an octopus can open a jar? You put, if you put treats inside of a jar, an octopus will figure out how to open it. They're incredibly smart. They conform to whatever they needed to be to get what they wanted. But that's not how we should be. We need to conform to Christ. But in many times we struggle, we do whatever we can to conform, to get what we want, to make sure nobody's upset with us, to go along with the crowd. But I wanna challenge you instead, conform to Christ, conform to his ways. So Paul continues then, let me just read this again. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we get so much garbage in our head, then we don't know what to do. We can't sort it out. But if we will allow Christ to renew us in our mind, in our hearts, we will be able to sort things out. We'll say, man, that doesn't sound quite right. And you go to the, the Bible and in the olden days, you open up that paper thing, it's about that big and you, it's called a Bible and you go to the back and there was a list of things usually in most Bibles and you could look and say, you know, I'm struggling with lying. So we look up, look up, you know, things on lying and you could go and read about it. And I'm looking, I'm struggling with anger. You can go in the back and look up under the subject of anger and you can go and read about it. But we fill our minds with Christ. Number two, we don't just think like Jesus, we act like Christ. We need to reject living like the world. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. So I say, live by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature they're in conflict with each other and you don't when you don't so that you don't do what you want paul writes in one section he says why do i do what i don't want to do and why don't i do the things that i want to do and he calls himself what a wretched man am i have you ever found yourself doing that how come I do that? I know I shouldn't do that. You ever had to give yourself a pep talk or chew yourself out? Why? You're not alone. Why do I do that? I know what I need to do, but I don't do the things that I need to do. I do the things that I shouldn't do. I got that down pat. Because inside of us, is that sin nature that automatically draws us to the wrong way, the wrong thing. Paul goes on and he says, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have victory over sin. We can be set free, we can live free. So many believers who've trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior don't understand what it's like to live free through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, belonging to Christ. You must live an upright and pure life as a follower of Christ. 
You belong to him. Your life is not your own. He paid a high price to redeem you from destruction. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you are a chosen people. Hear this about yourself now. If you're with Christ, listen, this is who you are. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people, a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So let's do a real quick recap here. What are the results of the two ways of living? Last week, or I uh, used to visit Kent County uh, Jail. I was working there um, as a volunteer. I'd go in once a month. I used to do this at St. Clair County Jail too. But I went into uh, Kent County Jail. We would go in there as a team in my uh, the fellow that uh, got me into doing this, his name was John, and John had one message that he spoke quite often because there was a rotating thing. It's, it's jail, so guys were sometimes in there for a couple days, a week, somewhere in there for six months, all the way up to a year. And he had one message that I'd heard him share several times, but it was on sowing and reaping out of Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. And many people make poor choices, and they want to blame it on everything else but themselves. That's kind of a narcissistic attitude. It's everyone else's fault, and yet it's because of choices that they've made that they've reaped what they've sown. Whatever way you choose to live, in that way you will see comparative results. So how does living for God make a difference? The psalmist here in Psalm 1 makes it very clear that the man who lives for God and aligns himself with God, God's ways will be blessed. Let's go through that psalm now. There's six verses in Psalm chapter 1. I don't know if we have that on the overhead. Yep, there we go. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers Not so the wicked, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the entirety of Psalm chapter 1. It's very simple and when we're talking about the law it's the word of god if you're not in the word of the lord you can't know what it says you need to be in the bible the bible was written so that we would know what god wants he leads us and directs us so how does living for god make a difference verse 3 says The one who does this is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever he does prospers. In the Middle East, they would plant trees next to streams in order to protect them from drought. They survived when others don't. Did you catch that? If you want to continue to survive, you want your faith to be strong. Get in the word of God. Spend time praying. Meditate. What's meditate mean? Think on the things of God. Get your mind out of the gutter and focus on the Lord. When we live for God, our spirits are made alive. And then through the power of his spirit, 
Our lives flourish even in the midst of drought. We produce fruit that will last. What do I talk about in fruit? Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. Maybe you've heard these before. Maybe you've even memorized them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to the Spirit, Christ Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So what's the result if we live for the world? Well, the worldly, or the, the Bible calls it the wicked man, should not expect anything more than what this world can offer. I want to stop for just a minute. So many people have that attitude. Well, I'm just going to be happy and I'm going to live for whatever I can because when I die, there's just nothing. Or, you know, at the worst, I've heard people say, well, I know I'm going to hell, so I'm going to live, you know, live the way I want to right now. That is such a defeatist and sad, short-sighted attitude. There's so much more than what this life has to offer. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. We're reminded in verse four of chapter one of Psalms, not so the wicked, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. What is chaff? Well, chaff is what's left when you're harvesting. And you see all that stuff You've gone past combines and such, and you see all that stuff that's getting blown away, all the loose stuff, it's gone, just gone. It doesn't take you very long to understand that life goes by fast. I have two young adults now that have graduated from high school, and they're looking back. I just mentioned to McKenna, I said, it's gonna be weird, because all, all the others are gonna go back to school and you're not. And that starts clicking in that life is moving on. I can remember that things started really speeding up and all of a sudden I turned 21 and then I was 25 and I was out of college and then I was 26 and I was a head pastor at my first church. 10 years ago I was 16, now I'm a head pastor. Life went fast. And then the Lord brought kids for us and the kids were born and life changed again. And now I have one that's turning 20, one that's turning 18 and one that's turning 16. Been married 30 years now. That sounds crazy. That sounds like I'm old. There's some of you out there laughing. <laughs> You're not, thank you, thank you. Stay, stay strong. But what's the end of the path? The righteous man, the righteous woman, who lives for God in his thought life, in his actions, in his allegiances, will survive. But the wicked man, let me even be clear as we look at this final result of life lived apart from God, as we look at Psalm 1-5 again, he says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What do you have to offer God if you do not know him? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what do you have to offer your broken, beat up righteousness? On your best day, folks, we don't have enough to offer God. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not about what you know. It's not about what you do. It's about who you know and who you live for. It's so important. I want to close with this 
section here in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The world is going to offer all kinds of things. I started by talking about the Olympic opening ceremony. There's a lot of broken and hurting people that were involved in that. There's a lot of broken and hurting people that threw stones. There's a lot of people that argued, said a lot of nasty things. But here's the end of it all. Jesus loves every one of them. The ones that are confused about their identity, the ones that think it's cool to do what they did, Jesus even loves the ones that were mean and threw stones and said nasty things to those folks on Facebook and online and reporters and all sorts of things. You see, none of that is what God wants. God wants us to follow him, to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if Jesus loves people so much that he was willing to put his life on the line, to die, then we better love people too. Even when they're a broken mess. Remember, there's mornings you get up and look in the mirror and that's you. In stark contrast from Jimmy Soul's song, If You Want to Be Happy, stands Psalm 1. I went as far as rewriting a couple of the lines in that song. I don't know if you can get your tune in your mind or not, but if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, give Jesus, our Savior, your wretched, pitiful life. Let him wash you clean with his blood and fill your life with power from above. There's no greater thing than walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up as I close here. Don't take advice or think like the world. Don't act like the world. And don't buy into the philosophies or the beliefs of this world. And love people with everything that you've got, even the unlovely ones, because some days that's you. And Jesus loves you so very powerful.
Help us to walk in your ways, to not walk with others, to not sit with the mockers, to not go along with things that are garbage, but to follow you, to love those who are struggling, to love those who don't know you, who do make crazy choices that look ridiculous to us. Lord, I just pray that we would come to a point in our lives where others would look at us, maybe not even out loud, but say, what's different about them? 